After going over the concept of royalties, exploring the complexity of the different types of rights a CU artist has, and the royalties they can receive, as well as checking out who are the people that take a cut of the earnings that the CU's music makes, it is time to sum it all up and check how every single bit of what was explained before works in practical terms. Let's kick off this episode of CU Lounge. Welcome to Seiyu Lounge, I am your host Vanessa and today's topic is How do royalties work for Seiyu artists? And the time has come to sum up all that was talked about regarding music royalties. Don't worry though, I am not going to explore everything in depth again. If you are just catching up this episode without prior notice of the previous ones, I suggest you check episodes 34 up to 37 on all the technicalities behind publishing music and CU artists making money. Without further ado, let's go over how royalties work for CU artists. Please have into attention that the sort of timeline I've created for this episode is generic. Every CU artist will have a lot of things changing depending on the types of royalties, countries in which those royalties are collected, their contracts with music labels and publishing companies, and even if they are singer-songwriters or just performers. So yeah, this is a bit generic look at how CU artists get their royalties. Are you up for a new roleplay slash exercise? For this episode, you are a CU artist who just debuted. You're a singer-songwriter through and through, and this will be your second mini-album release. I will play the role of your music label representative or the music label itself to make things a bit easier to understand when time comes to collect money and the sort. Ready to work together? Let's go! First off, you create music. As you can expect, CU artists don't have a lot of free time. They have their, let's call it, daytime job as voice actors and then, when there's a free slot of time, they dedicate it to other projects they have complementary to voice acting. Some say you are actors, others are fashion designers, YouTubers or even teachers at voice acting schools. So they create music whenever they have a bit of free time. Some say you artists need to be in the zone to do so, others have words flow like water from a tap and write a whole lot. Others are quietly walking down the street and one rhythmic or looping sound triggers them a melody to play on piano or guitar. Few are the CU artists that can say I am working on new music in the studio. Like uh, rock stars say. That's talk for Old Codex or Gran Rodeo, not for solo artists. CU artists only spend time in the studio to record their parts, usually they aren't there for the whole production phase. So yeah, imagine you've just returned from a long anime recording session. Your manager is taking you home and you, in the back seat, peer through the window to the neon lights painting the skyline in the city. Rain pouring down outside and trailing the window that separates the comfort of the car and the cold streets. Something sparks in you and you grab your smartphone, opening a writing app to put those words or ideas into physical form. You later come back to those when you arrive at home, where you have a basic DAW, which is a digital audio workstation software in which you record the lyrics you sing and the melody, thus creating a demo. You can also record your voice in a recording app or have the chords as sheet music, whatever style suits you best. 
For reference, I've talked about demos and DAWs on episodes 15 and 14. Now let's really pretend that music labels are awesome, not pressing artists to release music all the time, shall we? So for days, weeks or even months, you work on that song and some others, creating your demos and then, when you are ready, you contact me. You tell me, the music label's representative, that you've got new music and want to release a new mini-album. You and I discuss when you want to release the CD in question and the music style or genre and I book a studio plus hire a producer to work with you. You're meeting the producer tomorrow. Note that I, the music label's representative, already paid for the studio rental as well as for the wages that producer asked for. Consider this an advance money I lent you and that, when the CD is released, you'll have to return it to me, the music label's representative. Usually that money is deducted from the royalties you get, so you don't need to actually return anything directly. I just said this to make it easier for you to understand how this all works. Either way, next day you head to the studio. You introduce yourself to the producer, who most likely has heard previous instances of you singing, to get familiar with your voice and technique, and both talk about the music you want to release. You show your demos to the producer, and after that he mentions that he'll work on fleshing out those by himself or will call for a professional arranger to do so. The arranger will check the shit music you wrote and change it in ways that will make the song better convey some feelings or create a unique ambience that you wanted but you weren't able to craft yourself. You're booked for next week to work on the fleshed out versions of your demos. When you arrive at the studio, you bring the lyrics you wrote and do a prior check of the arranged instrumental. The arranger, the person that helped turn your demos into fully bodied songs, receives a flat fee for each song he helped out in or royalties off of each song, whatever is settled between yourself, the arranger and the music label. After checking the songs, you head into the recording booth and record vocals. Notice that you wrote the lyrics and composed the music so you are owner of the publishing rights to your song. You don't play any instruments for your mini-album and let that task go to session musicians that the producer will pick based on how he wants the final songs to sound like. The producer comes to me, the music label's representative, asking for an advance to pay the flat fees of the session musicians. They will be paid for their performances on your mini-album, but they don't own rights over those. I, the music label's representative, now own 50% of the recording rights. Remember, I paid for your studio time, the producer, and now the session musicians. This is how music labels usually work, ensuring they get a cut of those royalties. Also, let's not forget, since you've recorded your vocals, you also own a part of the recording rights alongside the music label. To sum it all up, after recording your music, you, a singer-songwriter, own composition or publishing rights and master or recording rights over your music. Some are split with me, the music label's representative, as I will be promoting your music and I financed the production of the mini-album. Others are split with performing rights organizations, the ones responsible for monetizing your music, collecting any royalties that are due to you. So far so good? Say you artists and their representatives will contact intermediaries. So now it's time for me, the music label's representative, to come forward and do some magic. 
for your mini album to be distributed and registered, I have to step in. Since you are a singer-songwriter, you own composition and master rights over your music. As a music label representative, I will work with the distributor or distributors to license your music to streaming platforms. That's my work when it comes to your master rights. Now, when it comes to your composition rights, you can do one of two things. Either you register those yourself with a performing rights organization and a publisher of your choice, or let me, the music label's representative, license those with a performing rights organization and the publisher connected to your music label. Either way, the music label can't take a cut of the royalties you receive as a songwriter. Those are yours and, of course, you'll have to pay a fee to the performing rights organizations and publishers for licensing and publishing your music. But the music label can't take a cut of those royalties. Performing rights organizations and publishers only take a cut or receive a flat fee for handling or managing your music portfolio. You still keep over 50% of those composition rights to yourself. What happens next is that the time has come, your CD was released and now your music is played. So whenever a user on a streaming platform such as Spotify or Apple Music presses play in your music, it triggers public performance, mechanical and streaming royalties. All of those are collected by the performing rights organization and the publisher and later distributed to you and the music label. If your music is played on the radio, you get public performance and streaming royalties. When people purchase your mini-album, you get mechanical royalties. Remember, a physical version was sold, hence the mechanical in mechanical royalties. If your music is featured in anime or in a commercial, for example, you get synchronization royalties. There's a lot of money to be made in this phase. Therefore, the intermediaries collect and distribute royalties. The time has come for the publishers and performing rights organizations to collect your hard-earned money. They collect different types of royalties. Publishers only collect publishing royalties, the ones due to you because you own composition rights over the music. Remember, you wrote the lyrics and composed the songs. Then the performing rights organizations collect all other royalties. Both the publishers and performing rights organizations collect as well data. What kind of data? How, when and what music of yours was used or streamed? How many plays or streams your songs have? All this data is crucial for those entities or intermediaries to check how much money will be distributed to you and the music label, which is to say, the proper right owners. In the case of streaming, remember that I, the music label's representative, talked with distributors to make sure your music was on every storefront possible. Distributors will collect your royalties from streaming platforms and pass along the money you made to the performing rights organizations and publishers. Finally, it's time to receive that money. The rights holders get paid. The money that the distributors, publishers and performing rights organizations collected in your behalf is going to be distributed. You, the artist and the music label which I am representing here, receive a share of the streaming royalties, performance royalties and synchronization fees. At the same time, the publisher and you, as the songwriter, receive performance royalties, mechanical royalties and synchronization fees. Performing rights organizations and distributors take a cut of these. Notice how, by being a singer-songwriter, you take performance royalties, mechanical royalties and synchronization fees twice. 
Yep, it happens and it means that you are, first off, owner of your music, to various degrees of ownership, and are making quite a lot of money off of your music. Now, distributors only get a cut of the royalties for services rendered. Publishing rights organizations also get a cut of those royalties. Publishers collect your 50% of publishing rights and also take a cut of those for managing your portfolio, but never take the full 50% for them. Now it's just you and me, the music label's representative. Let's imagine that the money that is left to distribute between us is $200,000. Remember, the music label owns 50% of your recording rights. Now it's where things get trickier. If the music label you're in is an indie music label like Artsonic, then you are entitled to 50% of that money. That's $100,000 for you after selling your mini-album. Congratulations! Per usual, indie music labels are more generous, making their artists feel like they really own their music. And indeed, they do. Indie music labels never take more than 50% of the royalties for themselves. However, if you are part of a major music label, like Sacra Music, Lantis or King Records, you are only entitled to a 15 to 18% cut of that money. In this case, that's between $30,000, which is 15%, and $36,000, which is 18%. That's your money to keep. Good work. The difference is noticeable in the money you make when signed to a major music label or a minor or indie music label. But remember, major music labels can put you out there, and the exposure on TV, radio, magazines and the sort really help raising those sales numbers. Minor or indie music labels allow for more freedom, but you have less resources. Minor or indie music labels usually can't put their talents on TV, radio or magazines which makes for less exposure. And that's the end of the exercise. Thank you for accompanying me until this point in this episode. Finally, the talk about music royalties is over. I guess you can rejoice? I hope this deep look at music royalties cleared up some things for you and you now understand a bit better how important physical sales for CU artists are and how many entities will take a cut off of the money they make with their music. Streaming is a good option for us, international fans, but it doesn't help their careers all that much. So you now understand that millions of streams or views usually don't translate into millions of dollars in royalties. Streaming doesn't pay well. At the same time, I hope you understand why many CU artists want to compose and write their music. Did you notice how they get twice as much royalties as performers? It is appealing to be a singer-songwriter. Both the creative freedom they get and the fact that they own the music they create makes their music and thus their careers in the music industry all the more meaningful. Not to say that being a performer is a bad thing. Having the music label doing everything for them saves a lot of time that CU artists can dedicate to their voice acting job, which is invaluable. And there are some CU artists that don't know how or don't like to compose or write their music. Fair enough. They of course lose a big chunk of what could have been their money to performing rights organizations, distributors, publishers and the music labels they are signed to. Also by the end of it all, I hope you got to better know how the music industry works behind the scenes. Now tell me, 
Do you think it is sustainable for Seiyu to venture to the music industry? Can they make a living off of being artists? Let me know in the comments below and remember, leave your comments as complex or as simple as they may be and you can be featured on upcoming episodes of Seiyu Lounge. If you enjoyed this episode and don't want to miss the Hand That Feeds HQ's weekly mail Seiyu and music-related content, hit the subscribe button. I'll return next week with another episode of Seiyu Lounge. Thank you for listening and see you guys around.